Welcome to Hearthstone Deck Tech Season 2, Episode 7, and we're talking Pogo Rogue with Kriya. Here's going. Hey, hey. Um, so, we have a special guest today. Um, a very common high finisher in the Standard Legend um, rankings and on the stand, Standard Legend ladder, and also a very prolific rogue player in my mind. I, You know, whenever I go to... Uh, Reddit, and I look into like rogue discussion. I always see this guy's name pop up all the time, uh, and and it's an honor to actually get to have him on the, on the podcast. Um, you know, if you've been following season two of this podcast, we really try to put the focus on players who maybe aren't uh, in the limelight as much. And I think this is one of the best rogue players out there. Very intuitive, puts a lot of thought into a lot of the plays, especially the early game decision making. And I think that makes him a very special player. So. Uh, welcome, Kriya. How you doing, man? Thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. G can you just tell people at home or people listening to the podcast more about yourself and your Hearthstone experience? Sure. Uh, I'm Kriya. I've been playing Hearthstone for about probably three or four years now. And I'm mainly a rogue main. Um, I have something like nearly 7,000 rogue ranked wins, which is a little bit over... Um, I think if you go by my win rate, probably over like 15, more like 14,000 uh, total rogue games. Wow. If you're going by like the 50 50 thing. So, uh, yeah, I like to play rogue. <laughs> Dude, that is crazy. Um, well, how did you come up with the name Kreya? Kreya. It's Kreya. actually uh, a shortened version of Kree Ara, which is a boss and a different MMO that I played called Old School Runescape. Oh, wow. Cool, cool. Um, what got you started in playing Hearthstone? Like, why did you decide to get into this type of card game versus, I don't know, Magic or any other card games? Uh, honestly, I'm not sure. I can't remember. I think I just saw it on the App Store one day, and I was like, I think I'll download that. And then I found out you could play it on PC, and I was like, yeah, that sounds good. And then at the time, I was a free-to-play player, so um, I couldn't really afford to play all the different classes. So I figured if I just disenchanted every <coughs> card from every other class that I could just play, you know, one class and have a collection for that class. And so I disenchanted all my other cards and only played Rogue, which is why I have, like, an obscenely large amount of Rogue wins. So to this day, do you still primarily only play Rogue? Uh, basically, yeah. No, <laughs> like, not... I dabble, I dabble in other classes occasionally <coughs> when I see something that might look fun. But it's mainly still just rogue. Like, n no other class compares when it comes to, like, ranked wins. All my other ones are at, like, maybe 500 wins. I think my second highest next to rogue is probably Warlock at 1,000 wins. Wow. So you're, like, the the Zed-a-lot of rogue players. <laughs> Something like that. Almost. But, like, everything's got to be gold, right? Like, I mean, you got to have, like, all the rogue cards in gold. If you only play rogue and you just dis disenchant everything else, it's got to be all gold. I actually do have some... Uh, I have some all golden real cards, but I don't use them that often. Oh, there you go. I see. I see. Um, what are <laughs> what are some of the major accomplishments or goals uh, that you hit in the game, um, and how did you go about uh, accomplishing them? Um, honestly, my first goal was was just to hit legend with rogue, and then after I did that, um, I wanted to get really good at the miracle rogue deck, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and. I feel like I mastered that deck, and then I wanted to, I really wanted to help other people get good at the deck as well, because I saw a lot of people making some suboptimal plays. And so then I put out a couple guides on how to pilot Miracle Rogue correctly. Um, after doing that, I really wanted to reach High Legend, and a couple couple expansions ago, I think back in Nangoro, I reached, uh, I peaked at rank 30 Legend playing nothing but Miracle Rogue, so that was a pretty big accomplished accomplishment to me. Um, it still actually kind of is to this day. I really pride myself as a Miracle Rogue player, and so hitting High Legend with Miracle Rogue was like a, a blessing. And I actually did it again, um, I think last month actually. I hit like rank 9 Legend with Miracle Rogue using like Auctioneers. And that was like huge for me because I love that deck. So, okay, I got I have a two-part question here since we're talking about Miracle Rogue. What is your favorite archetype uh, of all time in the history of the game? It's got to be like combo for sure. Okay, but no, like, particular combo deck that sticks out to you? Like, uh, I don't know, Leroy, Cold Blood, Double Shadow Step, or...? Uh, so, I actually, this is actually kind of funny. Um, for the longest time, 
I used to run the, I don't know if you remember, but Faceless Manipulator, Deck yeah. Hand, yeah, uh, yeah, Double yeah. Cold Blood. <laughs> yeah, I used to run that for a really long time, actually. And I even had access to Leroy, but that one was just way more fun to pull off. So that's got to be... Um, you know, you talked about a, a Miracle Rogue and how you piloted a deck, that deck for a long time. Um, when do you think Miracle Rogue was the strongest as a deck? Like, what was its strongest iteration? It was definitely before the gadgets and then Leroy nerfs. I don't think it's ever been stronger, actually. I see, I see. Um, you know, it, I, gosh, man, we're, go, we're taking a sidetrack here, by it, but since you are such a prolific Miracle Rogue player, I do want to ask you a couple of these questions, um, uh, in particular about the archetype. You know, I, I see often that people say, like, when a new expansion comes out or uh, when there's a new pool of cards that come out, uh, Miracle Rogue is usually a great deck to um, take on the ladder because it's pretty streamlined, uh, I guess, in its approach, uh, and it can punish a lot of these slower or more um, unoptimal deck lists. Do you think that Miracle Rogue kind of falls off as a meta matures, or is it like always a good pick? Um, it definitely requires a very specific meta, like. When I hit uh, rank 9 Legend, it was actually pretty difficult because Warrior is a really hard matchup, actually. It always has been, too. I remember even back in the day when they had Justicar, um, oh, Warrior yeah. was just the bane of my existence <laughs> queuing into that. So it definitely requires a very specific meta. Um, when, I hit, when I hit rank 9, it, I think it was because the meta was still in its infancy, and there were still a lot of people trying to figure things out. I noticed a lot, actually, that um, the high Legend like high legend ladder tends to be way way ahead of the curve mm -hmm. uh compared to like the rest of the ranks like rank five to one i guess in between there mm -hmm. so um you can kind of like abuse the fact that you kind of know what the meta is already going to look like uh you know going forward and then you know craft your deck accordingly and so you know generally what happens is the high legend meta finds something out and then maybe like i don't know a couple days later the rest of the ladder starts to kind of follow suit because i see oh so and so had really good success with this deck at High Legend, so I want to try it on ladder, and that's how that kind of like trickles down. And so at the time, it was while people were still trying to figure out what was like you know the best thing to play, mm -hmm. and so I was definitely like farming some of the slower decks for sure. I see. So yeah, I definitely think that Miracle is better, like because um, there's a lot of unrefined stuff going on, and it kind of preys on the unrefined stuff because it can do surprising amounts of burst. I man, I really enjoy Miracle Rogue. I. I, well, I, you know, I, th I think maybe it's just Gadgets and Auctioneer. It's just such a r ridiculously cool mechanic. Um, yeah, Auctioneer's great. Just, like, drawing a bunch of cards is crazy. Like, I even, um, what is that deck? Like, Nomi Priest. Like, I mean, that oh, yeah, is yeah. just as crazy. I mean, nearly as crazy, you know? I mean, the, the wind condition's a lot slower. It's a, it's a little more different, more control-oriented, and not as tempo-based. But, I mean, it's still just amazing. I like to draw cards, and drawing cards is always pretty pretty fun with the catch send <laughs> um you know with the grandmaster series out and we had dog winning the uh the tournament the other day uh are there any players that you've seen on the ladder or that you know of that you are kind of surprised that didn't make the grandmaster uh uh grandmaster requirements and uh, why uh what was your question uh any players that uh, good players that aren't in grandmasters but that you kind of thought should have been a grandmaster honestly yeah gallon i was actually rooting for gallon to win that tournament and seeing his game too man that misplay where he attacked in the ice uh, barrier destroyed me. <laughs> yeah. but uh gallon should he definitely deserves to be gm yeah he's so my pick would definitely be gallon i you know it was pretty crazy like yeah there were a lot of good players yesterday i it was pretty yeah, there were it was, it was interesting um what are three basic principles that uh, people who don't finish in Legend are missing? And what, what could they start, like, working on to, you know, help them get over that hump, I guess? So, um, I actually have a little bit of experience with this. I actually used to do coaching. Mm -hmm. I still do occasionally, but it's pretty rare um, just due to time constraints and stuff. But a lot of the people that I coach who were trying to get into Legend... They, a lot of them had the same common issues of not understanding roles. So not understanding like when you are the beatdown, like mm -hmm. when you're the aggro deck and when you're the control deck, you know. 
And just because you're playing an aggro deck, like, you know, I don't know. Let's take Pirate Warrior as a really good example. Back in Mean Streets of Gadget Sand. Mm -hmm. Just because you're playing the aggro deck doesn't mean that, you know, you are the aggro role. Sometimes you're playing the aggro deck and you need to be the control role, meaning you need to remove minions and, you know, etc. And so a lot of players who are failing to make it to Legend, it's generally because they are either over-trading or under-trading. Yep, yep. You're really just learning your roles, basically, and learning, you know, when to push face. Yeah, I mean, I think I, man, I don't want to, like, I'm so, I really like the deck list you sent today, but I'm I'm really just trying to ask a couple more questions before we really jump into the deck list. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that is uh, some good advice regarding, um, you know, some basic ways to improve. Anything else you think... Uh, Play, uh, players could work on if they're missing that legend rank? Honestly, it's uh, also probably ladder anxiety. A lot of people will queue casual instead of ranked. Just queue ranked no matter what, man. You know, don't be afraid of like losing some stars. It's not a big deal. Yeah, that's crazy yeah, to me. We have floors yeah, the now. There are ranked rank, floors man, now. Hit. I mean, yeah, I, re exactly. I mean, take I mean, <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, take advantage of the ranked floor. Yeah, I mean, I remember when there were no ranked floors. And I think there was one season I was like rank, I went to rank two or something. And this is before the ranked floors. And I was adamant. I was adamant about making Trogzor work, right? So I had this priest, Trogzor priest deck. <laughs> and I, I mean, I felt like it must have been pretty good because I was like, you know, okay, I'm rank two right now. I'm, this is this viable. It's viable. And then, you know, a day later, I'm like rank 16. And I got dudes in my friend that's like, yo, man. What what happened? Did like did they change your account or something? Or like how come you're ranked sixteen? You're ranked two yesterday, and I was just like, man, I, you know, I messed up. But uh, you know, I I mean now we're so great, uh, lucky to have uh, the rank floors. I mean that's just like I, you're not gonna get legend by not playing ranked, right? So that's I mean simply that's it. And, exactly. You know, if you want to challenge real players and improve, you got to challenge the decks that they play on the ladder. And like you know that's. I mean, there's no harm in being ranked three or four or one or legend or, or whatever, right? So, you know. Uh, what are your goals in the future of the game? Like, um, like what, what, what do you help, uh, hope to accomplish moving forward? Honestly, I started um, doing tournaments more. I'd never actually really done tournament play, so I started doing that. And hopefully I can get qualified for Seoul, and then we'll see what happens from there. That's mainly my. Uh, so, how do you like the specialist format? What do you, um, do you enjoy bringing that one deck with uh, two different variations of it? Or yeah, I actually love specialist. Um, so the very first specialist tournament that I ever did, I placed top four, and that was actually like gut wrenching because I was so close. Mm -hmm. I was so close to beating the guy, and I lost because of a misplay. Like, I looked over my replays and I realized. I made a really obvious misplay, and had I not made that, I definitely, I feel like I could have gone all the way, because the next opponent that I was facing was, you know, playing a deck that was unfavored to my deck, so, but, uh, yeah, I definitely love Specialist, man, I feel like it allows you to play cards that are underplayed and underutilized, you know, mm -hmm. that are too niche for the ladder. Yeah. How, I mean, how was that? So you got top four, like, how long was that, how long of a day of Hearthstone was that for you? Oh, that I mean, that was an 11-hour tournament. <laughs> it was yeah. long. I, I, I'm, and you know what I'm saying, like, getting second, third, or fourth, that feels like getting last, right? I mean, yeah, you know, it, it doesn't, wrenching. I bet. I was, like, I, I was like, I wasted all day just to get fourth. <laughs> but do you, are, is there money involved in those types of tournaments, or are they just for the qualifying spot? No, nah, it's just to qualify, but you get, like, packs, I guess. You get free oh, packs, okay. so well, you could do it for a free pack, I guess. I think I, I mean, got, like, 15... You got 15 packs? Yep. Oh, that's, I I, you know, that's 11 hours. That's not bad, I guess. I mean, that's 15 packs, right? I mean, that's something, <laughs> I guess. It's not um, terrible. I mean, I was <laughs> able to take breaks. And... Yeah, yeah. And that's just pretty cool. I, I, I heard that they're trying to change that format to be like a double elimination or something. Like, I, you know, instead of... Yeah. Um... Yeah, they're doing it now. So, um, well, some of the tournaments are where if you lose like a match you're just knocked out out of the bracket ah wow that, those are a lot quicker actually those are significantly 
Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'd rather, I don't know. I, I think I'd rather do that, but I mean, I guess that sucks too. Like if you, you know, you need draw bad in a it's game. It's more punishing, yeah, like, yeah. exactly, yeah. It's way more punishing because then you just get knocked out, but it's also way faster, so you don't really feel like you. Interesting. So let's let's talk about this deck today. You brought Pogo Hopper Rogue, and I know we were talking about this deck a little bit on Twitter before the um, the the buffs to certain cards happen. Um, so I'm really excited to see uh, this list that that you brought today, which is slightly different from a bunch of the variants you had before. And you know, like we know that you are the Rogue specialist, so you have tested everything under the sun uh, in regards <laughs> to this deck. For those of you who do not or aren't watching the video and don't see the uh, deck list. I'm just going to read it for you really quickly, or you can just use the deck code in the information on the podcast. Uh, but it's two backstabs, one prep, two shadow steps, two pogo hoppers, one togwoggle scheme, blood mage downos, two lab recruiters, uh, two novice engineers, two saps, two shivs, uh, van cleef, two evil miscreants, two fan of knives, snip snap two uh witchwood pipers one barista wow what's her name barista tavern barista whatever you guys know what i'm talking about the, the five drop right uh <laughs> barista harris Lynch. oh barista lynch and there you go uh one harrison jones uh mira's unstable element Ziliax, and good old countess ashmore who's seen that card get played guys so, I, I, you know, honestly, when that card came out, I was like, oh, my God, it's Curator. This is like Curator except without the taunt. It's kind of cool. You got Rush. You get Lifesteal. You can grab spells with Lifesteal, like the, the Priest spell, right? I mean, that's a pretty dope card. But, um, yeah. you know, let's uh, – can you just tell us about this deck? Why did you bring this deck today? So, personally, I believe that Pogo Rogue is one of those decks – I mean, first off, it's a control killer. It definitely has a – a real role in the meta right so if at any point control decks pop up pogo rogue will show up to shut it down it's like it's like quest rogue it performs the same function it also has the same type of uh matchup spreads or rather in some ways right so quest rogue generally lost to aggro yeah it, like at the time i think it was pirate warrior at the time that was the deck that was you know the aggro deck that was floating around and to this day, we have yet to have another Pirate Rogue, or sorry, Pirate Warrior, sorry. Um, the closest thing to Pirate Warrior was like pre-nerf Miracle Rogue, and then they went and nerfed Prep in, in Raiding Party. Yeah. And that was the only deck that was like, that could like even come close to Pirate Warrior of old. So considering the aggro decks, the benchmark for aggro decks aren't exactly what they used to be, um, Pogo Rogue is actually, it has, it's not nearly as polarizing to play as Quest Rogue. You can beat like Shaman, you're actually favored versus mid-range hunter. Um, you're super favored versus control warrior. You struggle a little bit versus bomb warrior, but I wouldn't say it's unwinnable. It's probably like maybe like a 45-55 matchup with the bomb warrior being favored. And overall, it's just a super fun and skill-testing deck to play. You know, like there's so many different lines and so many different ways that you can win, and by shuffling like your own minions into your deck or shuffling even your opponent's minions into your deck just based on what you think you might need to win the game. Like, I had a game where I shuffled a... I actually just had a game. I'll have to post the replay on Twitter. But I, I shuffled a Ziliax into my deck, and then I tutored the Ziliax with Countess Ashmore. Mm -hmm. Because, they're, you know, Ashmore was in my hand, but I had nothing to draw off of it because I had Ziliax in my hand already. So I ended up playing Ziliax without the magnet, uh, magnetized buff. Mm -hmm. And then I shuffled into into my deck and then drew the second copy with Ashmore. And my opponent just couldn't handle that, and they conceded because that let me turn the corner by gaining so much life. So the deck is very flexible, and I definitely think it's going to be a real contender um, in the future as, as we get more cards in the uh, in the card pool. Damn, that's interesting. Um, man, you know, I'm, I haven't tried this version. I, I tried one of your earlier versions. It was pretty fun, like Pogo. But I, I tried it right when the buffs came out. So, like, everybody was trying, like, different variants of Pogo Rogue. Um, you know, like, yeah. they had Spirit of the Shark and, and things that maybe were, are, are less optimal or not optimal at all. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I really like your Hook Tusk Rogue. You had, a, like, a Hook... It's kind of like a Tempo <laughs> Rogue, but with Hook Tusk. Yeah. And I always play that, and I enjoy that deck, like, a lot. Like, Hook, to hook Tusk just feels like such a strong Tempo turn, you know? Um, but anyways... 
back to this deck list that we're talking about. Uh, what are the common like mulligan strategies with this deck? Like versus an aggressive start or versus bomb or control warrior? Uh, what are you looking to keep in the opening hand? Generally, you're looking to keep kind of the same stuff. So you want like early game stuff. Most of your deck costs five or less. So you're looking to keep things like evil miscreant. You want to keep temple tools like backstab. Um, and then obviously pogo hopper. Uh, you don't really want Piper, unless you're on the coin, and even then, that's kind of a sketchy keep. You want to only want to keep that against like control decks. But um, yeah, against aggro, you want bas basically early temple tools, you know, and then versus mid range. So basically, mid range hunter, you kind of want the same stuff. You want to look to get your pogos online. So pogo hopper, um, maybe keep lab recruiter, but only if you have pogo hopper as well with it. Uh, stuff like that. Definitely keep fan of knives against. Uh, like flood decks like zoo and token druid you know that's an auto keep basically what, what snip snap is pretty good too to keep snip uh, snip snap is a is a good keep yeah you can keep that basically whenever off the coin on the coin always against any deck it's just a great card how about the novice engineer that you throw that back right you just can trip that card is that just a card to draw one later in the game or do you keep that typically? yeah yeah you don't generally you don't really want to keep any draw cards in your mulligan Okay. You just want to use them. What like the only what, one that you would keep in the mulligan would be like fan of dyers, basically against like specifically. A... Are there some ideal like power turns like, or you know what what is an optimal kind of like opening that you'd want to get versus some any particular matchup? Is there is there like some crazy opening that you're like okay yeah this is this is a good opening? Yeah, if you get like if you get pogo hopper shadow step lab recruiter in your mulligan in your opening hand that's kind of like an i win hand basically <laughs> you can play pogo and then bounce it on one you have a one mana three three and then you shuffle more copies in on turn two and from there it's really hard to lose because you just kind of have board right from turn two you know you have a three three and a three two and you shuffled more uh pogos into your deck giving you what, five copies at that point so you're pretty likely to uh or actually four copies at that point sorry Mm -hmm. So you're pretty likely to draw into more pogos from there, especially with how much card draw the deck runs. Kind of, from there, you just kind of you know spiral out of control. So it's hard for, to lose with that hand. Versus the slower decks like Control Warrior, you're just trying to reshuffle as many pogos as you can for the inevitability, like that long. Yeah, so for Control, against Control decks like Control Warrior, Control Shaman, um, even Freeze Mage sort of, Sort of, but not really. Uh, you're just looking to sh or shuffle and draw. So, shuffle as early as you can. If you can't shuffle, literally draw. Even if, if they have nothing nothing on the board, you're going to Phantom Knives because you want to draw. Mm -hmm. If they have no minions on the board and it's turn four, I'm playing Shiv if it's in my hand. If I, have, if I don't have Piper, you know. You're playing anything and everything that you can to draw cards to get closer and closer to that, uh, that inevitability point. And from there, you know, you just... Once you get the the key combo pieces which is pogo hopper and lab recruiter especially if you get myra's then it's just kind of a blowout then you start shuffling into your deck and kind of crafting your hand to uh you know look a little something like a ton of draw and, and tools to tutor pogo basically so pipers so for example in like a control matchup instead of shadow stepping like a novice engineer mm -hmm. i would like a higher value target would be shadow step which would piper for sure like i i wouldn't even tempo out which would piper and keep it there if i have shadow step i would play it and then shadow step it back to my hand immediately so i can play it next turn because drawing those you know drawing those combo pieces is more is more important versus control than you know just shuffling through your deck naturally um how in what situations are you okay with playing the first pogo hopper on the board <coughs> without being able to <coughs> i'm sorry copy it with the scheme recruiter or a bounce effect like is it like jay druid where you're okay yeah. with throwing it out on one and letting it die maybe or yeah i'll always throw out a turn on pogo hopper against a class that can't ping it naturally so like if i'm on the coin for example i'm not going to play on turn one against a mage who like their best turn to play in this meta is always ping right mm -hmm. they have no two drops they're, they're not playing sorcerer's apprentice on two yeah they're just going to ping and then they're going to play either uh Stargazer or Luna or Arcane Intellect on three, stuff like that, right? Like, you know how Mage plays out. So, I'm not playing it against a class that's going to ping on two anyway. 
but I will play it against every other class that, that sometimes can ping, but doesn't always. So, like, I'll always play it on turn one against Shaman. I'm always going to play it on turn one against Hunter, because they don't always have Spring Fall, right? That's just two cards. Yep. That's the only way they can ping it. Um, I'll always play it against, like, uh, Druid, because making them hero power on two is way better than them playing Developing Dreamway board, Guardians yeah. or whatever, you know, tempoing out minions on two. So basically, you always want to play it on one against any non-ping class. You're probably not going to play it versus Rogue because, you know, they have Dagger and whatnot. But any class that can't ping it naturally and it costs them a card to do so, that's when you're going to play it on turn one, if it's the first copy. For those of you joining in and uh, probably have your own questions about the deck, because there are definitely a bunch of different lines of play, I... You, in the description to the podcast, there will be a link to Kriya's guide on Reddit, which is very in-depth and talking about talking a lot about mulligans and different concepts of the game here. Um, what are some decisions that are maybe not as uh, intuitive and that new players to the deck tend to probably misplay often due to lack of experience, I guess? I would definitely say it's holding Pogo Hopper for too long. Like... I see a lot of players lose games when they bounce Pogo at least once. Uh, all right, so first off, getting that first bounce is the most important, okay? After you play that first Pogo Hopper, all the other Pogo Hoppers you play are going to be above tempo plays, right? A 1 mana 3-3 three, three is a you know an above average tempo play. Yeah. A 1 mana 5-5 five, five is an above average tempo play. It's just the initial one that's a 1 mana 1-1. One, one. So I see players who have bounced it once already or played it once at least. And then they hold their other copies. You know, you shouldn't be doing that. You're playing for a max tempo. Having a 3-3 on the board is better than having, you know, a pogo hopper in your hand. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's the second one and you don't have shuffle, I can kind of understand that. But even then, like, sometimes it's just better to play that second one and risk it being destroyed without the shuffle if you have, like, an alternate win condition. So that's mainly going to be if, like, you have tog togwaggle in your deck or if you just, you know, depending on your board presence, really. Like, if you've got the whole evil miscreant game plan going on where you just have like a ton of lackeys on the board from like faceless lackey summoning more minions or mm -hmm. witch lackey evolving into like big minions from there you know obviously you're just gonna you have so much pressure on the board already that it doesn't matter if both of your pogos die you know yeah. so you need to be able to evaluate the situation and realize okay i need to be playing for max simple here even if the pogo dies because i can still win it's identifying when you can still win even if that pogo dies and if it doesn't sometimes you get super rewarded for playing it like, you get to push damage, and then you top deck Shadow Step, and you can, you know, maybe value trade with it, and then Shadow Step it and heal it, and it comes back bigger. Or maybe you top deck Lab Recruiter, which has happened a ton for me. There's been so many times where I played Pogo on turn one, and then I literally top deck Lab Recruiter, Lab Recruiter on two, and then I can, you know, play that and shuffle more Pogos into my deck. Or I play Pogo on four, and then I top deck Barista Lynchon, and now I can, like, copy and add another copy to my hand. Sometimes you just have to play risky, you know, based on what the situation is you know Barista Lynchin um if you're not like how often are you you're you're only ever playing this card with a bounce effect on a board or are you ever tempo or uh without a with a battle cry on the board or or are you ever Based tempoing her out on an empty board maybe I don't know I would only tempo her on an empty board if there's something coming up that you need to answer but um you have no other way to answer it without having a minion on the board. So, for example, that would look like this. For example, having like a, you're playing against aggro shaman, right? And they've mm -hmm. overloaded their mana on turn four, and you think that they might have um, what is that card? Thunderhead or something. The four man, yeah, yeah, Thunderhead, yeah. yeah, right. And so you don't have any like the deck doesn't run eviscerates or anything, right? And so mm -hmm. the only way you can answer it is with like maybe a minion trade, and you've got no minions on the board. In that case, yeah, maybe you want to play Barista Lynchin so that it can contest that Thunderhead with, like, a Backstab or something. Or, like, a, a your Hero Power plus, like, Fan of Knives or yeah. Shiv, whatever. But if it's not an emergency, you can kind of think of it like Azur Drake, really, right? Mm -hmm. Azur Drake was a 5-mana 4-4 four, four draw card with spell damage. Mm -hmm. Like, Lynchin is kind of the same thing. It's a 5-mana 4-5, four, five, and you can think of it as, you know, in air quotes, draw card. So you kind of want to play it as long as you've got, like, maybe even one Battle Cry is great value, because that's just an Azure Drake at that point, yeah. with, like, one more health, you know? So if you, th if you go playing it, thinking about it, like, oh, this is an Azure Drake, you're going to realize that you can actually play it pretty often with just, like, even one Battle Cry, and that's really good value. Cool. There are two cards I, I wanted to ask about whether or not you ever keep them in a mulligan, too. Um, 
uh, Togwago Scheme versus, like, I guess, Control Warrior or slower control decks, and um, Sap versus, like, Paladin or Hunter, like the mech magnetized type of archetypes. So, um, you never keep Scheme in the Mulligan, no. Scheme is, like, Scheme is a hard card to use in that it's so easy to use it that people overthink it, which makes it hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's also one of those cards where you only want one of them, even though you can run two. Uh, scheme is best played when it's going to shuffle, like, maybe between three and six minions. Any, well, three and five minions, actually. Anything above that is kind of, like, sketchy, because then you, you start to dilute your car, uh, mm. your top decks. Especially... Especially if your pogos aren't that big yet. You know, you don't want to be top decking like one minute three threes on turn seven, or one yeah. minute five five on turn ten if you don't have it. So you always ditch scheme, and you generally want to play scheme when it's at like two between. I would say two to four is pretty safe. Cool. That's when you just play it on whatever you need to play it on. Um, I never keep Zilliax, and that's just because I run Countess Ashmore. Even if you don't have As- Ashmore, I still wouldn't keep Zilliax just because it's just a, uh, you know, your cards are so cheap. They cost, like, I think the cap is five anyway, depending on, like, you know, what your top end is. Mm-hmm. That you're generally always going to have a better play than, you know, to play Zilliax. Like, you shouldn't need to play Zilliax. Zilliax should, Zilliax should just be a bonus. The only time you're actually absolutely going to need to play it is versus, like, Zoo or, like, maybe Token Druid. And even then, like, the Zilliax could have been, like, a, a Phantom Knight or something. Or something. Be, yeah, exactly. Oh, so I, I meant Sap, sorry. Uh, keeping Sap versus the mech decks, like, uh, Paladin oh, Sap. Um, no, I wouldn't keep Sap either, just because the deck has so much cycle that you, you're you going to get to that Sap eventually. Man, you're making this deck sound so juicy, like I'm just like, man, I'm going to, as soon as we get off this podcast, <laughs> I'm going to mess with it. How about, so what does like, Count, Countess Ashmore draw you besides Zilliax? It draws Zilliax, it draws Snip Snap, and it can draw Thanos. Uh-huh. And, like, if you haven't drawn Snip Snap or Thanos, or sorry, if you haven't drawn Snip Snap or Zilliax, then you can curve out pretty well by playing Ashmore on 7, and then you can play Zilliax plus, plus Snip Snap on 8 and, like, magnetize them. And that gives you a 5-mana five 5-5 five, five rush with life steal that death rattles into two one ones. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so it's got use outside of, you know, just Zilliax. Even if you draw, like, Thanos, right? That means next turn you can Thanos and Fan of Knives and, yeah, yeah. you know, manipulate the, the spell damage in some way. Um, you know, I, I I really don't play Snip Snap a lot. Like, I mean, I only play in the Hook Tusk Rogue because your list has it, and, you know, it's nice to put it on those three, four spider tanks and stuff. But, uh, like, how good of... And, you know, I played it in the combo Warlock decks in Wild where you just make a big uh, stealth mech. But um, how good is that card? Like, when is it at its best? I mean, are you typically trying to play... Like, I mean, assuming the situations are all different, right? But, like, I, I mean, yeah. what, what are the best situations? Like, turn nine, playing uh, three creatures on board, magnetizing one creature, or, you know, playing it early on turn three or turn four or something as, you know, one or two mechs? Like, what, what, what makes that this card, card so strong? It's disgusting at all points in the game. It's gross on turn three because a lot of the time, like, if you're on the coin, which is 50% of the time, you know, you coin Miscreant, and then it's like, what are you doing on three? Generally, you have two lackeys, and then you're going to float one mana if you play those yeah. two lackeys, right? Or it's like one lackey plus hero powers, generally yeah. how that turn goes. Instead, you can just play Snip Snap, which is a, you know, it's two damage. And then if they kill it, if they don't kill the back end, it's two more damage. It's still two damage, you know? Mm-hmm. You can also, like, um, I do this a lot, actually. You can trade, if it's already on the board, you trade with it, and then you can attach Zilliax, and that's, uh, that's seven damage right there. You know, it's two from the bump. Plus, uh, you know, the three magnetize onto like a 1 1, and now the 1 1 has rush, and you can tech with that too. Sorry, that's six damage, not seven. Mm-hmm. Math is hard. <laughs> but yeah, that's, you can squeeze six damage out of that instead of like the five, where if you just magnetize it to the Snip Snap, you know, it's the three attack of the Zilliax plus the two attack of Snip Snap. So you can charge for five, or you can just trade with it first to kill it, and then magnetize a 1 1, and that, that pushes six instead of five. Um, it's, it's just a flexible card. Like, if it dies. It lets you trade into, like, you know, tokens and stuff. It lets you magnetize onto a, a pogo that's only been bounced, you know, that hasn't been bounced at all. So that one mana pogo is now, like you said, a spider tank on turn mm-hmm. four. It's just really flexible, you know. It's a great card at all stages of the game on turn three, all the way up to turn nine, you know, so. How it's about just, that? It's really good for board presence. It's kind of like Zilliax mm-hmm. in a way. 
it's it's just one of those cards where it's like it's free for everybody so there's no reason not to play it, especially because the power level of the card is just so disgustingly high yeah uh how about mirrors unstable element when do you play this like uh, do you have to have so, a scheme, or I mean, can you just go for broke sometimes? Well, what's when do you rock this? That card, it's a little difficult to use to identify when you should be doing it. But basically, right? So, long story short, the deck is a tempo deck. Okay, yeah. at its heart, it's a tempo deck. So what that means is you're going to be running out of resources by like mid to late game. You should be low on cards in your hand if you're playing for tempo. You should be low on cards in your hand, and Myra's just refills your hand. And on top of that. By the mid to late game, you should have already shuffled at least at the very moment, at the very minimum three more pogos into your deck. Mm -hmm. So you're going to top deck one mana fat guys that you're going to play, and they're only one mana, you know. So you can play them out like if, if you have seven mana, you play Myra's, you can play two pogos. Yeah. And if you have a third pogo in your hand, that's the one that you would shuffle. But basically, you use it to um, refill your hand and to you can also use it to kind of blow out your opponent if you shuffle basically just more pogos into your deck which is actually a, a pretty common occurrence so you'll do something like play pogo hopper to draw plus one more card play myra's that's six mana uh it's a little bit less if you prep it out and then you play your lab recruiter behind it and that shuffles three more pogos into your deck and so now you're top decking you know exactly what you're going to top deck you're top decking more pogos which are at that point in the game pretty big you know yeah. especially versus control warrior you just blow them out super hard with that because you can cycle you have all the time in the world to cycle through your deck to craft your hand to be exactly what you want it to look like which is basically like card draw so that you can play more than one pogo per deck right because naturally you just draw one pogo if you make sure that you have draw in your hand though you can play a pogo from your you know the one that you draw naturally on your turn mm -hmm. and then you draw another one with the card draw mechanic of like shiv or novice engineer and then you play a second pogo so you're playing two pogos per turn which is a lot harder to deal with than one pogo per turn so it's basically just used to steal games out, really. Just like Miracle Rogue, um, the aggro version, you know. Uh, there's Except in, instead of burst, we're using pogos. Yeah. There, there isn't a way to go infinite here, right? Or, like, you mean we like, have a like limited number infinitely? of... Yeah, like, we have a limited number of pogos here. Uh, Well, you're only limited by, like, scheme. So generally what you'll do if you happen to draw into scheme and lab recruiter mm -hmm. you would just use lab recruiter first and then as you draw those three pogos that's just that adds three more onto the scheme as you end your turn so when you draw your last pogo then you would scheme more into your deck and by then it's probably like you're shuffling four to six more pogos in there probably but mm -hmm. uh you could go infinite with lab recruiters if you're trying to like never fatigue or uh... you just keep shuffling lab recruiters but honestly you don't need that many pogos to win you only need like like, post Myra's, you maybe need, like, two or three more pogos. You very, very rarely need more than three. Ever. Cool. Game just ends by then. The pogos are too big, and there's almost no deck that can actually deal with that many large minions. What What do you consider, like, the 30th and 29th, I guess, card slots here? Because, uh, you know, like, I know the I know Togwoggle is an option. I've I seen you had lists like that before. Like, what are some possible flex cards? Uh... In this list, would and when, say, would you when would you put them in, I guess? I would say Ashmore is a flex card. Um, if you're not facing as much aggro, she's not as good. She's really good because when you're facing aggro, you want that Zilliax, right? That's how you that's how you win the game. When they see you heal for like 13 or however much, mm -hmm. that's when they concede. So you could cut Ashmore if you're not running into aggro. Um, you can, Prep is actually a, a very easy cut. Prep is not nearly as good as it used to be, so... Even with that many um, spells in the deck, prep's just not that great. Uh, it's it's just good, you know. It's not great anymore. Um, you could cut. I would be hesitant to cut Snip Snap just because it's so strong. I would say that it's, it's pretty core. You can cut Harrison Jones in a meta where you're not dealing with as many um, weapons, but Shaman's just being unchecked right now, right? Yeah. Like all the Doom Hammers and Lickums running around. Yeah. <laughs> Harrison is just too good, especially Warrior. They're running Weapons Project. Yeah. They're running Super Collider. Uh, rogues have their hero power. Some of them are still running Raggle Pick. Like, weapons are still in the meta. And Harrison, you know, he gives you survivability and card draw, which is exactly what you want in this deck. But you can cut him in a, in a non-weapon heavy meta. And you can replace him for alternate win conditions. So like you said, Togwaggle. Um, Vanish is another good one if you're facing a lot of mage. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the only two that come off the top of my head. 
So how could man? I really like Togwoggle just because it's such a silly card. I, I you know I like I like the treasures and stuff. Like I mean, when when is Togwoggle? Like what type of meta do I want to think about bringing Togwoggle in? I'm like Tog Tog is a lot better against slower decks, and it's really bad against fast decks. Like you'll find that against a fast deck, you're never gonna have time <clears> to actually play to generate a lackey if you don't already have one, and then play Tog and then play yeah. his treasure. You're almost never gonna have that time. And I know that just from playing multiple aggro matchups with Tog in the deck. Uh, but he, against slow decks, like, even against Mage, that's slow enough. They have a powerful swing turn, but they're slow enough to let you actually get off a Tog Waggle. He's really, really strong. Like, getting Wand is really great. Um, even Gauntlet, or Goblet, sorry. Goblet mm -hmm. post Myra is just disgusting. Oh, yeah, <laughs> just man, draw, that like, sounds ridiculous. Your hand with Pogos. Oh, my God. I've done that once. So yeah, he's against slow decks. Togwaggle is like the best tech card. Oh my god! I, I oh my god! I want to do that so much now that you just mentioned that. <laughs> no, because because you know, <laughs> so good. Because <laughs> I'm thinking about it right now. Like usually, <clears throat> when I play Togwaggle, the only or well, when in like I play him in the hook test rogue list that you have, and whenever I play him, I uh, or usually the times where I'm really thinking about the decision making of what treasure I'm really gonna get is like versus warrior. Um, you know, I'm like, okay, am I going to get the two legendaries or am I going to go for, you know, the draw three and make them zero cost, you know, but I've never yeah. really picked Goblet actually because my hand has always been pretty fat. Um, so how do you decide, like, uh, how good are the four treasures, like, you know, and, and when are they at their most optimal, I guess? So I would say the three mana six, six taunt is best against aggro. Um, that's literally like a last resort, right? That's like, my hand looks like backstab, prep, uh, I don't know, fan of knives, novice engineer, Thanos, right? It's just garbage, it's yeah. garbage hand. I have nothing proactive to do, and I'm literally dying on board. That's when I would actually pick the taunt because they have to sink damage into the taunt or resources, and it turns my garbage hand into like legendaries that might actually do something. Okay. Um, Wand is just good all the time. It's a little it's a little worse on this deck because um, the curve of the deck it's is pretty low, low yeah. anyway. So by the time you're playing Wand, you could already play all this stuff for probably at the whole turn anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's still good just for the draw three, right? It's it's a three mana draw three at at its worst, which is still good. Um, Wand is definitely a lot better if you're playing it like like you mentioned, Hook Tusk, which is a top heavy deck. Wand is a lot better in decks that have a, a heavier top end. Um, what is the other one? Oh yeah, the crown. So yep. the legendaries. That's always good if you can, if you know that the opponent can't really deal with it, right? It doesn't really matter what you get. You could get like two six threes and hook tusk, and that's still, it's a it's three mana. Six yeah. three six three. That's that's yeah. really high tempo play. So whenever you're looking to play for max tempo is when you would pick uh, crown, and then lastly, goblet God. is really underpicked, and that's just because there's not really a deck that can utilize it that well except for pogo hopper and like you know pogo hopper post myers like i said that's when you can afford to pick goblet and that that'll just blow out any literally any deck in the meta every deck well i am sold i am adding togwoggle to this and i mean you know there's <laughs> only got you only have like what the lackeys to or the miscreants to generate lackeys yeah but. you can add there's another list that has rats but um and that just cuts ashmore and slip snap and it replaces mm. them for rats and togwoggle mm. I think I got rid of prep too to actually fit Togwaggle in there, so you can fit them in there. Oh man, great minds think alike, because that's what I was like, okay, I'm going to cut this prep, and I'll put in this Togwaggle, and then I was just debating on where I would make the cuts for the lackeys. Very interesting, man. Um, and I, this is what you've been playing all month, huh? Or like since the since the patch? I've been playing a little bit of um, Agro Shaman as well, but mainly just Rogue. I've only got like... Uh, Maybe 40 or 50 games on Agro Shaman, and the rest is all some variation of Rogue, whether it be Pogo or Hook Tusk. What, what, do you like the state of Rogue right now? I mean, do you think the nerfs uh, really hurt it, or...? I think that Rogue is in, a, is in a fair place. Like, Pogo Rogue is super fun to play, so I'll, I'll always jam that deck regardless of what the state of Rogue is. Rogue as a whole, actually, even if it's in a bad... Like, I've played it in a bad state just because, you know, Rogue main, by the way. But, uh... I think they're fair right now, and I feel that Warrior is kind of unfair in that mainly it's just Dr. Boom. Dr. Boom's not a fair card to play against because, you know, it, 
it lets you beat board based decks without being a board based deck. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not really fair. I you know, like I don't how, how would <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say how would other classes feel if Rogue had a hero that said all your pogo hoppers have rush. Exactly. So pre pre pretend that Rogue has a hero that's like a permanent magic carpet buff. Yeah. And then you, you literally can't play anything on the board without it getting destroyed immediately. Like, that feels bad to play against. It feels oppressive. And it's like, why why does this deck that, you know, isn't a board-based deck, why does it crush my deck, which is purely built to be board-based and maneuver the board through efficient minions, you know? It's not really fair. I mean, well, Other than Warrior, Rogue feels okay. And that's even only the passive <laughs> that, like, that yeah. doesn't even take into account the yeah, hero power or, like, Omega yeah, Assembly, just, which just fucking is hurts good. so bad, man. Fucking Omega Assembly. I'm, yeah, and it definitely God. It hurts more because, like, it's a one-mana draw rush minions, which is crazy. Exactly. That's, it's, it just, oh, yeah, it feels, oh, ooh, my heart, man, my heart. <laughs> <laughs> you, my blood, my high, I got to get some blood pressure pills now because I'm, I'm getting that high blood right now, dude. Um, man, yeah. <laughs> You know, thank you for sharing this deck list. I really appreciate it. Anything you want to say to people at home um, in general, uh, like where they can find you on uh, social media or contact you for coaching or anything like that? Yeah, you can find me on um, Twitter. It's at PV Pretender, which is just P-V-P-R-E-T-E-N-D-E-R. -E -E and then um, you can contact me on Discord if you need any help. I'm always in like the competitive Hearthstone Discord giving out advice to people who need it for free and stuff like that so i don't mind helping people and my discord is crea hashtag five nine eight five awesome heah. hey man I, I noticed on your picture here you you're, you got your snowboarding outfit out is that that is a oh, snowboarding it's... outfit right or is that a motorcycle it's for skiing yeah <laughs> oh skiing awesome man awesome that's skiing goggles and the ski and there you go guys there you go skier and her stone player crea thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast uh, guys, you know where you can find him. Um, uh, and yeah, we will catch you next time on Hearthstone Deck Tech. Thank you so much.